I'm Stephanie Judd and the Women's Ministry Director at City on a Hill. And as part of our Him and Her series, I'm joined now with Rob and Claire Smith. Welcome. Uh, Rob is an Anglican minister. He's also a lecturer in theology and ethics at Sydney Missionary and Bible College and engaged in doctoral studies in the theology of gender. Claire is a New Testament scholar. She's a women's Bible teacher and has written an excellent, very helpful book, uh, God's Good Design, what the Bible really says about men and women. Rob and Claire, thank you so much for joining us today. We're really grateful that we can gain your wisdom and insight and benefit from your great love for Jesus as you've thought through these issues of gender, gender dysphoria, transgenderism. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thanks, Steph. Good to be with you. Um, Rob and Claire, uh, there's lots that we have to talk about. Uh, this is a very uh, a hot topic at the moment, the topic of gender, just generally, gender dysphoria, transgenderism. Uh, there's lots of, of terms for us to sort of talk about that I'd love to explore with you and, and to get your insight into. Uh, we're just really glad for the thinking and the research that you've done in this area and the way that you're really leading the way in many ways in equipping churches and and Christians to think well uh, and think biblically on this issue and uh, respond in a way that honours Jesus. Uh, before we talk about and unpack some of those terms and, and discuss some of the, the issues, uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about why uh, this topic and the issue of gender and gender dysphoria, transgenderism, is something that's important to you, uh, that really drove you to want to research this area and talk about it. Yeah, by sharing the role. Well, yeah, I can tell you a bit of my story. Claire, I mean, Claire's been working on questions of gender mm. and men and women, particularly for, for decades. Mm. But for the, about about the last six or so years, I was doing some work on sort of same sex attraction and in preparation for the whole same sex marriage debate. Mm. And as I researched that area, and I guess I tried to think my way around all the issues, I realized the transgender question was kind of lurking just off mm. to the side and was really looming to sort of take over centre stage once, right. uh, really once the same-sex marriage question got answered one way or the other. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I, I guess, became aware of a need for further Christian thought, theological reflection on mm. questions raised by the whole transgender yes. phenomenon. And at the same time, realised there wasn't a lot going on. There wasn't a lot that had been written. Yeah. At that stage, at least, there's a bit more now than there was, say, three or four years ago. But uh, yeah. um, So that's one of the things that prompted me to start uh, gathering resources, yeah. start thinking things through, and start writing and speaking and what we've been doing together. Fantastic. Claire? Then the urgency mm. to really address these issues arose because uh, someone close to us mm. uh, with gender dysphoria uh, made the decision to transition, and, and so there was an urgency to, mm. to find resources and also to work out Christianly how how do we think about this, how do we love the person, mm. and as a researcher, that mm. meant that I had sort of well, we both scoured the world and particularly the evangelical world and discovered that there was a that there were there was stuff being written by people who don't handle the Bible the way that yes. we would want to handle the Bible, mm. but actually not that much being written by people who do handle the Bible the way that we think the Bible as the authoritative word of God. Mm. And so uh, so that really pushed us to, to do more work. Mm. In God's kindness we've now just, we're in contact with people who are doing good work in this area, but certainly three or four years ago that wasn't, wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. uh, Rob, I'll just go back to a word that you used uh, to describe uh, this topic. Mm. Uh, you used the word a phenomenon. Mm. Uh, how much of a phenomenon is this at the moment in terms of our wider culture? What, what place does the, the topic of gender dysphoria and, and transgender have to think in, in our, the psyche of our culture, in our society yeah. in Australia today? Well, I, yeah, I deliberately use that word phenomenon because I think it is a phenomenon that yeah. really since about 2013 has been with it. It's mm. sort of exploded sort of on the scene. Uh, I mean, the sociologists talk about the transgender tipping point yeah. happening really in that year. Uh, and certainly by the next year, that, that very title is being used, but uh, a Time article 
I assume it's a big boy, but we, we, suddenly something that had been in, in the background, sort of really out of public consciousness, had really taken center stage. Yeah. And, and was causing a radical rethink of what it means to be a human being. Yeah. Uh, because at the heart of transgender ideology is the idea that you, your biological sex has nothing to do with mm. your gender identity. Mm. They're completely separate things. Mm. They might happen to coincide, in which case they, the, the name being used now is they call you cisgender. Yes. Uh, on the same side, your gender is on the same side as your sex. But if they don't happen to coincide, then you're transgender. So it, it's human beings have never thought this way ever before. Yeah. This is a brand new um, this anthropology that's mm. been launched. And uh, it has massive consequences in a thousand directions. So. Yeah. So, do you mind just unpacking some of those terms for us? So, um, some of the terms you just mentioned gender, I guess, generally speaking, but sex, um, intersex, gender dysphoria, transgenderism. Can you just let me unpack some Claire of those terms? is, in some ways, <laughs> even better equipped to, to unpack the terms. Right. Um, having done a lot of detailed work on this, now. Ask the button. Well, I'll, I'll start and you can chip in. Sure. Uh, I mean, th there are a whole lot of terms and a whole lot of terms that easily get confused. Mm -hmm. So it's, so I'll try and work through them. Great. Any that I miss, you tell me what okay. I've missed. So there's sex, which, yep. which really means biological sex, right. or sometimes it's referred to as birth sex, mm -hmm. and that is the biology of your body. Yep. So that's your chromosomes, um, anatomy, mm. sex, primary and secondary sex characteristics. Mm. That's sex. <clears throat> then there's the other term that that often gets confused with is sexuality, mm. which is actually not to do with biology, mm. but that's to do with uh, romantic or sexual attraction. Yeah. Yeah. Then. Uh, then there is a gender and sex and gender. So sex is the biology. Yep. Gender is the, the social and lived expression of what historically has been sex. Mm. <laughs> so, and so, connections between those two. So, well, so, so there's, there's been an historically there's been an expectation of alignment between the two. Mm. So the separation between sex and gender, as far as we can tell, happened in the early 60s, about sure. 1963, mm. where the two were distinguished. I don't think distinguish them, distinguishing them is problematic. Right. What's happened now, though, is a decoupling. Mm. So they're actually independent entities that are sort of freewheeling. And mm. so, so the distinguishing, that's not a problem, but the decoupling, yes, that is a problem. Yes. Uh, sex deals with the question of male or female. Mm. Mm. Gender deals with the question of masculine and feminine. Interesting. Mm. So, so that's one way of thinking mm. about it. Mm. Uh, then uh, coming back to the term that Rob used there, cisgender, uh, that's actually a term that I choose not to use or we choose not to use. Mm. Uh, that's a new term brought in, as far as I can tell, in the 90s. Yep. Uh, and it is, it is where sex and gender align. Mm. So on this side of, whereas trans is on the other side. Mm. Okay. Mm. But it seems to me that even the invention of the term assumes transgender. Right. Which, well, it normalises. It normalises as a normal phenomenon. Mm. So it's a term that's generated by the ideology that sex and gender are independent. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a term that's used in order to say it. there's no no difference. You just might be cis, you might be trans. Uh, you know, equally, I guess, normal ways of being human. Yeah, right. So when you, when you talk about the decoupling of sex and gender, am I right in thinking that what is kind of meant by that or, or interpreted uh, within the um, transgender kind of framework is that you can be biologically male or female, but uh, mentally, you associate with you could associate with either a man or being a woman in terms of like the way that it's viewed or spoken about. Is that right? Uh, yes. I mean, there are a couple of sort of layers to that answer. Yeah. Uh, 
the first is, I guess, just to to um, define transgender. Mm. So what, what, what's easy to miss is that there, there are actually two groups under the T in the LGBT right. yeah. acronym. Two groups, at least two groups. At least, at least two groups under the T uh, tra for transgender. The first one I, I would call ex sort of experimenters, activists and ideologues. Mm. Okay, now they believe that, that that gender is a social construct, and that uh, so so their transgender uh, living out is a pro form of protest. It's really saying gender is a social construct. I'm going to mess with the gender right. norms, yeah. and that's why I'm transgender. Mm. So mm. that's one group. The other group is a, is a group uh, who who suffer what is diagnosed now as gender dysphoria, mm. where there is a, a psychological mismatch between biological sex and gender identity that causes mm. distress. Which right. is what you were talking about. Right. Distress. Yes. So there, are, and and that's that's a clinical entity uh, that's recognised, and and we need to engage with people in with that understanding. Yes, with com compassion right. and love, but they're two quite different groups mm. actually under yes. the same umbrella. Right, and how we engage with both groups is quite different. Yeah. And one of the key differences is that sufferers of gender dysphoria mm. have a very clear binary understanding yeah. of gender that right. you're either male or female, or masculine yeah. or feminine. They just feel they're mixed the up; they're in the no. wrong body. Yeah. Whereas people over here don't have a binary view of gender at all. They have mm. a completely fluid. diverse and fluid understanding of gender, that there are many genders, perhaps an infinite number, uh, or perhaps no genders, really. If, if, if the whole thing is a social construct, why, why have it at all? Um, so one sociologist has these lovely categories. He talks about the trans of migration, uh, where, where you move from one to the other, mm. move from male to female. He talks about the trans of between, where you move from one extreme to somewhere in between. Mm. And again, there's an infinite number of dot points there, potentially. Uh, and then he talks about the trans of beyond, where you actually seek to transcend gender uh, altogether, mm. leave the categories behind. And that's often where some of the activists are coming from. They actually are re rebelling against categorization. Right. Um, and we want to let's dispense with the categories, let's push outside. Into mm. And see where that and what is behind that is queer, is queer theory, mm. where the goal is to have uh, gender diversity mm. across the population. So not a gender binary, but yeah. gender diversity and gender fluidity within the individual. Yeah. So you can wake up a male and go to bed at the end of the day as a female. So you can move. You can move along the spectrum. Mm yourself yes and society has a diversity of gender great yeah. I, I find that really helpful actually to think about because i think uh, at least in terms of my experience of, of how christians have spoken about this it seems that often people are in different camps you know it can be uh, that idea or awareness that just like you know multiple things in our world our post one world at the moment it seems that gender is just something that people are choosing for themselves and uh maybe christians get nervous about that uh, and therefore um, finding it difficult to engage with the idea that for someone who uh, that feeling of gender dysphoria is not uh, something they would have wished or hoped for themselves, mm. it's very difficult mm. to engage with the complexity It's not that. chosen. Yeah. It's yeah. not chosen. Right. So that's, the, that's one of the differences mm. between those two groups. Mm. Uh, no one that we know with gender dysphoria, and we know a good number of people, Yes. Have chosen, mm. which is not not the same as saying born this way. Yes, um, which is what some people assume that implies. Yeah, uh, it just means that they did, didn't decide at some point. I I want to be like this. It's, it's yeah. something that's developed, uh, often for well reasons that are hard to discern. Mm. Uh, so mm. it's certainly not something they want. Yes, yeah. distressing, disruptive experience. So so, but they also have choice how they respond to yeah. it. As we do in all of life, mm. uh, in the things that we experience, we have 
responsibility yeah. and and so so for those uh, individuals who do experience that kind of unwished uh, undesired uh, sense of dysphoria mm. uh, can you talk us through a little bit about what that's like for them uh, perhaps for the, the people that you've engaged with that the uh, Claire mentioned that um, someone you love who is uh, transgendered um, what's that like what does that feel like what are the thoughts emotions physically what goes on for those individuals well I for me, for me, one of the sort of the aha moments yep. for me was with with the person that we that's close to us. Uh, even the experience of walking down the street and catching a glimpse of yourself in the reflection of the windows yes. causes the person distress wow. because you're looking at someone who doesn't look like who you think you are. So wow. you imagine we're all used to looking at ourselves in the mirror mm. and 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 having some affinity with the image in the mirror. Yeah. And th this is a person who looks in the mirror and thinks that is not me. Wow. So so for, for me that was mm. an aha sort mm. of okay, this is a just such a deep sense yes. of mm. of just grating where, where the whole, uh, your sense of who you are just just breaks with the way people are engaging with you, with the way the images that you're seeing, the clothes that you're putting on, like the whole thing. The way, and, the way one sufferer put it that really struck home for me was, they said it's, it's like being trapped in a suffocating costume that you're unable to take off. Mm. Well, it's powerful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And that must be enormously distressing when I think about you know, how often you're just an example of you know, looking at yourself in a reflection. The amount of times that we, we see ourselves in the mirror, what we pass in the shop, and um, the way that we associate with our body. That must be just a constant battle for these individuals, isn't that right? Many of them just struggle with this constantly. Yeah, there's a, there are degrees of extremity and um, likewise degrees of um, uh, yeah, constancy. Mm. Yeah, so for some people, yeah, some people right. comes and yeah. goes, and mm. some it's more extreme than others. So, yes. Yeah. So for those in our churches who are experiencing this, um, you know, when, when they come to us or where, when they open up in a say a Bible study group mm. or come to speak to another Christian and say, you know, this is going on for me, uh, what is a, a helpful way to respond? Are we? Um, I mean, I, I, I guess it. Also depends on what they're seeking. If they come to us saying, "I think I'm in the wrong body, and I'm considering transitioning," um, are we for that? Are we? Do we discourage them for it? How do we help them? Uh, what do we? Well, you just asked several huge yeah. questions. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That we could spend a very long time talking about. Give a about simple that. one word answer. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, the place to start is to again acknowledging the existential pain of, of yes. that state, being in that state. So. Um, that's where we've got to start. So yeah. to recognize this, this must be horrible mm. um, and yeah, just extraordinarily painful. Um, but the question then is, what do you do about that? Mm. And obviously, the answer that's being promoted. Um, by the, uh, the transgender movement is, well, simple, you, you transition. It can be done. Now, 50 years ago, it couldn't be done. Mm. 30 years ago, it couldn't be done. Whereas, obviously, now, all kinds of things can be attempted, at least, to, to help a person feel like, on the outside, the way they feel on the inside. Yes. Look on the outside, the way they feel. Yeah. But is that really addressing the core problem is the mm. problem is at heart psychological problem um, it, there's nothing wrong with the body of the person right um, and that reminds me we need to come back to yes, the question of inter intersex mm. which you asked earlier but if there's nothing wrong with the body of the person then the problem is in the mind and so it begs the question why would you change the body to align with a distorted mind mm. rather than attempting to change the mind so it can reconcile with a healthy body. Mm. Um, so just from a purely you know, 
medical point of view of it. And I think that ought to be the preferred path to, to go down. Mm. Uh, I mean, look, there's so much that can be said, but I mean, keep, keeping with that medical uh, line, two things I would say is that even the, the longitudinal research that's been done mm. on people who fully transitioned mm. does not bear out the positive outcomes that you would expect any other treatment regime to bear out. So, so uh, the most recent longitudinal study was one done in Sweden, which is perhaps the most uh, progressive, sort of transgender-friendly society country in the world, and and a twenty-year study showed that the the su successful suicide rate of fully of transgender people, people who'd had sex reassignment surgery was 19.1 times that of the general population. Wow. That is not a good outcome mm. for people. Mm. You know, if you're wanting people to flourish, that is not a good outcome. Mm. Mm. Uh, and because of that, some places who, that have been doing sex reassignment surgery have stopped doing it. Yeah, well. Because, mm. because there was no appreciable mm. difference uh, in terms of the long-term medical uh, outcome. I mean, the, other, the other thing is, uh, and, um, and I, uh, I'll give you the details of this because I was involved in a, in a paper, a, a major report that was written for the Anglican Diocese up here last year mm. on these things, is that there are medical downsides, risks of taking long-term synthetic hormones mm. for the rest of your life, for example. Uh, so, so cardiac risks and cancer mm. risks and so on. So. Mm even looking at the effect of the synthetic hormones on the body is not a good medical outcome. Mm, mm. So quite apart from the sort of the logic of treating the source of the problem, which is the mind, yes. there are other arguments against medical transition. Mm. Uh, that's even before you come to consider God's word and God's purposes for us as mm. men and women mm. and God's vision of human flourishing. Yes. So, so on the medical side, there are good arguments against transitioning, and that's even before you come well, to understand. And the other thing to add is that gender dysphoria is almost never what we call a lone traveller. Mm. It's accompanied by various comorbid conditions, nearly always anxiety and depression, which is, uh, but that often it's paired up with autism spectrum mm. disorder mm. conditions. Uh, and various other things as well. And often it's been found when those other conditions are treated, the gender dysphoria reduces, yes. if not disappears. Um, and so again, it's, it's, well, from my point of view, just tragic and irresponsible to tackle the gender dysphoria with hormones and surgery and leave alone all the other problems mm when, in fact, if the other problems were addressed, it may actually bring the gender dysphoria down to magical size and mm. not remove it all together. So, mm. yeah, there's a very strange approach to this problem that's right. uh, emerged out of the whole transgender phenomenon. Yes. And it's being driven ideologically, not scientifically. Yeah. That's, can I just make two points, please? First is we're not medical doctors, mm. so that's important. Yeah, that's sure. that's in, important to yep. say. Although I, I do want to say that, that that we had two doctors on this mm. committee that I that, that I was involved with last year that wrote this report. Mm. So and, and it's their conclusions of what I'm talking about. Uh, the other one is, and and this comes back to your initial question of what do we do if we meet someone? Yes. And that is to understand that at the moment. If someone presents to their GP or goes, for example, at a university to the counselling uh, service at the university and says they're experiencing some sort of gender issues or, or, or un unrest about their gender, they will very quickly be referred to a gender clinic and really once there, it's a one-way street. Mm. So mm. the gender cl clinic is not there to... The gender clinic is to help you resolve your dysphoria by helping you transition. Okay. 
So the psychological issue, which you're saying is actually the, the core issue, this is primarily for those who experience the dysphoria and the, yep. the um, all the tensions and uh, difficulties that come with that, it's uh, primarily a, a psychological core issue that needs to yep. be addressed and spoken yep. and, into. And, and, and that's why it is classified in uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for, for Psychiatric Disorders, mm. because it is... It's a mental health mm. issue. Right. Now, here's, here's bringing the intersex question. Mm. The only exception is when gender dysphoria is in some way related to an intersex or an undiagnosed intersex yes. condition. So in the DSM-5, the latest version of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, they distinguish between gender dysphoria with what they call a disorder of sex development and gender dysphoria without a disorder of sex right. development. And I think wisely so, because if you have a disorder of sex development, of course, people are calling them sometimes a disorder of sex differentiation, uh, and for some reason that's not been diagnosed, well, that may well create all kinds of uh, confusion if you perhaps look male on the outside, but internally you're, you're mm. not, or, or mm. there's some, some ambiguity. Hormonal so. imbalance, yes. for example. And so one of the first things that needs to be checked out for someone who's experiencing gender dysphoria is whether there is in fact some underlying pathology. Pathology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that just needs to be explored and mm -hmm. ruled out or, or, or otherwise. Mm -hmm. so. I feel like one of the, um, the big challenges with this topic and how we talk about it within the church and as Christian individuals mm -hmm is the topic of identity more broadly. Uh, it seems to me in our society, in our culture, this issue, in fact, issues of gender and sexual orientation, identity, is very much considered the central, a central, if not the central aspect of who we are, how we define ourselves, and therefore how we live. Uh, but Christians, of course, um, really prize their union with Jesus as primary, the primary aspect of who we are. And in terms of how we respond to these issues, I think there's often a, a tension with uh, what does it mean to live for Jesus, uh, particularly for our, our brothers and sisters who experience gender dysphoria and are told, and you know, we're hearing that this is a central or the central aspect of who you are. Can you just uh, help us think that through? How do we respond in terms of the place of these things in our identity as a whole as Christians? Well, the, the, the key thing, I think, is understanding the notion of givenness mm. as opposed to chosenness. We're, we're not self-creators. Yeah, that's something. We're created, we're mm. creatures. Uh, and so our, our identity is something that God gives to us and gives to us by making us in a certain way and giving us to certain parents and placing us in a certain family and society. Yeah, all of these things, we don't choose any of those. They're mm. given to us. Now, we can rebel against them and you know, try and reject everything we're given. Um, and that is part of the sort of autonomous spirit, I suppose, sure. to, to mm. want to make all of our choices. But mm. part of what the gospel teaches us is to simply receive. Mm. Uh, receive our very being from God, mm. let alone our new identity in Christ, mm. which, of course, is, is our redeemed being and our mm. forgiven and renewed being. So... Um, the notion of givenness, I think, is the, is the key one, mm, uh, just at the level of our creativeness. But then, of course, once we're redeemed in and through Jesus, all of that is heightened and given the wonderful focus of mm. our being in Christ. So mm. As sons and daughters of the living God, brothers and sisters of the Messiah himself. So. Mm. Well, and, and, and in addition to that, and you can talk much more about this than me because this is part of the thing that he's working on with his PhD, so I'll just remind him, <laughs> is, is, the, is the unity of body and soul. Yes. So, so, so body and soul are not free, yes. wheeling things, but actually that we're created by God, mm. uh, knit together in our mother, as our bodies come together. We, we personally are knit together in our mother's womb mm. and we're a psychosomatic unity, so... Is there more you want to say about that? <laughs> or am I just... No, well, that's the heart of it. Uh, I mean, I, I do think the Bible makes clear that we there is a certain duality about our yep. humanity, that, that there is an inner and outer person. Yep. 
in body and soul is one of the ways that scripture talks about this. But uh, unlike in certain schemes, it's taught they're not those two things are not taught about independently, um, but rather in a much more integrated um, mm. way. So there's an infusion, as it were. So we, you know, the soul is the soul of the body, the body is mm. the, body, the body of the soul. Mm. Um, and so we're in soul beings or embodied souls, or you know, however you want to put it. You, yeah. Uh, or psychosomatic yeah. uh, beings is uh, what we're. Mm. Um, so seeing that integration is helpful. Mm. And what it means is that if the body is normal, it's not lying. Yeah. That's the, I guess that's the take then sure. of this mm. theology. Mm. Now, this is where, again, we need to clarify if there's an intersex condition, because then the body can be, uh, as it were, deceiving as at some level of appearance. Mm. But if there's nothing, no ambiguity with the body, mm. the body's not lying. Mm. It's telling me the truth about who I am. Mm. Uh, and uh, so to reject that story that my body is telling me is, again, to reject this idea of humanness. Mm. Particularly if the body is a healthy body. Mm. So, no, 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 but I'm, I'm saying that, for example, with people with with disabilities and so sure. on, to help people with disabilities come to wholeness yeah. is not working against the body that God gave them. Mm. So sure. I'm just, just, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's what it's all about. about. All that. of our bodies have defects and some of them yeah. obviously can be very severe. Sure. Um, but just talking about at the level of our, the sex body, mm -hmm. is it a male body or is in our body. Mm. Whichever it is, that, that's telling us a truth about mm. ourselves. Mm. Like if my body is male, I'm a male. Yeah. And human and well human flourishing is achieved by moving towards wholeness. Mm. And so the goal in helping someone with gender dysphoria with is to move towards wholeness and integration mm. of body and personal experience mm. and identity. Mm. And so our, our goal in, in helping someone is to help them uh, welcome with thanksgiving mm. and live mm. at peace with mm. the body that God has given. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the Bible we hear that the gospel of Jesus is good news for all people. Good news of great joy for the person who experiences gender dysphoria, particularly when they're, they're told that actually to be fully human, society you know, often shares that message that to be fully human is to express our, our, what our body is telling us, our desires of many people that, that will sound to them like transitioning, gender transitioning is the way to go. For those who come into our churches and hear the gospel as good news, uh, what does that look like? How does that offer hope to those who are experiencing gender dysphoria? Well, in the first instance, I'd say if someone walks through your door, you welcome them mm. with open arms. Mm. Right? doesn't matter what, what they're wearing, who they like. But the most important thing is that people know the Lord Jesus. Okay. Mm. You know, so... So we don't say, well, you can't come in here until you're like us. Mm. No, no, no. Come in here yes. and learn about the Saviour who loves. So, so I mean, I think that, that's the most important thing. Mm. Uh, I can jump in. That, mm. yeah, I, I think the key is like the now and the not yet. And this is the heart of the now. Mm. Jesus says, come as you are. Yeah. yeah. With all your mess. Yeah. And uh, I'll give you rest. Yeah. So that, there's the heart of the gospel. Come in all your confusion and your brokenness and mm. whatever state and stage you're in. Um, come to me. Let me forgive you. Let me then begin to restore you. So he takes us as we are, doesn't leave us as we are. But ultimately, of course, he's going to completely transform us so there'll be you know, a new creation. No defects, no mm. disorders, no disability, mm. no, mm. Yeah, no dysphoria. Mm. No. Having said that, we know several people now who have come to Christ mm. after they've transitioned and as an outworking of their obedience and faith and love of Christ mm. have, have taken the, I mean, God bless them, step 
to detransition. Wow. Uh, which for most of them is has been a, a slow process mm. of of cost. Yes. The cost of the site. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and these are people who need love and compassion and understanding and people to journey with them. Mm. Uh, as we all do mm. with our sin mm. uh, and with the struggles that we have. So uh, so I used the word sin there, so I can just backtrack to that. The experience of gender dysphoria is, is, is itself not sin. Mm. It is part of living in a broken mm. world. Mm. Uh, all, all of us have... Uh, parts of our minds and our bodies and our relationships that don't work the way that yes. they, they were designed mm -hmm. to work. And, and that's part of living in a fallen world. And so there's a person with gender dysphoria is not culpable for that, for that experience. No, any more than a person with anorexia or sure. schizophrenia. Yeah. The, I think biblically these things are afflictions mm. Mm. Uh, that come upon people in a sin-cursed world, yeah. but are not themselves the result of that individual's mm. sin mm. necessarily in any direct way. So, so how, for all of us, mm. the way we respond to, to our brokenness yeah. does have a moral component. Yeah. So there are right and wrong ways to respond. Sure. Mm. Uh, and to and to manage the, the burdens that we carry, the afflictions that we have, mm. the, the trials and so on. Mm. And and uh, cert certainly our understanding of the scriptures and these dear brothers and sisters we know who mm. have come to Christ uh, and who are detransitioning, or or even other uh, brothers and sisters who are Christians mm. who are struggling with this. Mm. Now. Not all of them are saying this, but certainly some of them. Their faithfulness to Christ yeah. means working towards living at peace with the body that God has given. Mm. Yeah, and it's, again, it's it's where the theology of the gospel is taken. So we are created yes. body and soul. We'll be raised body mm. and soul. Now, we come to Jesus in our brokenness, but he then begins to reintegrate us. Mm. Uh, and so, yeah, for these brothers and sisters, they've seen that. Okay, the Lord wants me to embrace the body He gave me, and to learn to love it, which can take time and not be simply done. Mm. But uh, that's the path to mm. tread, knowing that when you were word hope before, the yeah. ultimate hope is mm. that of that day mm. when there'll be no difficulty yes. with that, even though there may be lots of hardship along the way. Mm. It's going to be a good day. So at City on Hill, we're, we're really hoping that throughout the series, uh, it, it's a way in which people um, start to see that the church is a place where issues like gender dysphoria is, is not out there. It's actually in mm -hmm. here that there are people in our, in our church, in our body of Christ, uh, for whom this is very real. And our hope is that as these conversations begin, uh, many of our members, whether you people are experiencing gender dysphoria or, or whatever is going on in, in people's worlds that are heavy on their heart, that church is a safe place for people to share their stories, to speak into one another's lives with the hope of the gospel that we've just talked about. How can we as a church go about creating a church as a safe place? How can church be a safe place for those who are experiencing gender dysphoria? I can sound controversial in one sense, church is not meant to be a safe place for anyone mm. <laughs> um, because God is in the, 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 yeah. the renovation business yeah. and, and uh, is remaking us yeah. and calling us to make hard decisions yes. and to do difficult things. All it's time. not supposed to be comfortable. No, mm. no. I know what you mean by making a safe space and I totally agree we, we need to work at that. Mm. But I, I suppose I just wanted to start there and realise that Safety doesn't mean easy or comfortable. Yeah, that's not mm. um, Because we're called to a path of, well, self-denial mm. and, and, uh, and difficult choices. Um, and so we don't want to hide that from people. Mm. 
any of us. You know, we've all got difficult. The Word of God hits us in a hundred different ways, uh, and very difficult things. So we don't want to disguise that, and yet we want to obviously love one another and support one another and encourage one another, and acknowledging those differences and the hard choices. And so part of that then will I think mean we we come at things humbly. You know, the phrase "shared brokenness" mm. is a good one you know, mm. because. Yeah, we, we, we're coming at this as all together as broken people in different yeah. ways. Um, You're not surprised by brokenness. Yes, yeah, not surprised. Working together, uh, supporting each other, bearing each other's burdens, mm. uh, and and sometimes rebuking each other. And, and, you know, that wonderful passage in Galatians 6 where you know, Paul says, bear one another's burdens. He also mm. says, if anyone is caught in a transgression, those who are spiritual should restore them in, in gentleness. And so we need, we need that kind of help. Yeah. So that's part of my answer. We yes. will add on, I think, in a second. But part of making church safe is making it supportive, but also challenging. Yeah. I'd say two things. Mm. Uh, the first one is, uh, which is hopefully not controversial. Uh, <laughs> the, the first one is that transgender people very often get very socially isolated. Mm. Mm. So, so you do any reading in this area and see that even even within the trans community, they recognise this is a real problem yeah. and they're doing research on it. And so one of the things that Christians should do uh, is be able to love, like, love people and be there and uh, show godly affection mm-hmm. and, uh, and provide support and practical care and all those sorts of things, so that people don't become isolated. Yeah. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is we cannot have we can make sure that we're not setting up uh, one way or another unbiblical gender stereotypes. Mm. So uh, I think, unfortunately, a lot of Christian communities can have uh, very rigid uh, cultural gender stereotypes. Mm. Uh, that go beyond scripture. Mm. So when I look when I look at scripture and the, the, the instruction, you know, biblical manhood and womanhood actually is fleshed out in scripture. Not so much in this is what a woman looks like, this is what a man looks like, but how are we to how are we to relate to one another yes. as partners in God's world, yeah. right? yeah. in church and in marriage, and and. But then to put things on top of that, of you know, all women are to be, you know, mm. passive and sweet and lovely. I mean, I'm discounted already. You know, <laughs> Me one, too, one, one, one. Right. <laughs> but where is that in scripture? Mm. No, actually, what you see is there are there are characteristics, godly behaviour that is required of men and women. Mm. And how we do that will be different depending mm. on. Uh, the relationships that we're in yes. and our personalities and our stage of life and yes. all the cultures that we're part of. It looks very different in Africa to here or sure. very, mm-hmm. so on. So if there are rigid gender stereotypes, mm. it's very difficult for someone who feels. Yes. In fact, that's been one of my observations, is that uh, those with gender dysphoria have very, very rigid gender stereotypes mm. that are actually don't, stack up yeah. so you know it is that women don't like sport and they don't like engineering and they don't like so on mm. and, and all men all, love footy all and men beer. love footy and beer yeah. and you know wearing flannelette shirts <laughs> um and, and so really we serve one another and particularly we serve our children mm. who are growing up in our churches mm. by not having these very rigid unbiblical mm gender stereotypes mm. Mm. and allowing people, uh, allowing within within the body of Christ the diversity yeah. of expression of maleness and femaleness yeah. that, that God has given us he, with godly character. And here's the, the grain of truth in the whole gender diversity thing, which is that gender is not meant to be sort of a dot point here and a dot point there. Really. Yes. There, there are ways of being masculine, ways of being feminine. Now, what we don't want to do is erase the distinction. Yeah. and the, um, So we need to op- operate within realms without without blurring the boundary. Right. Mm. But, yeah, if you get that too tight, mm. 
and immediately you exclude a whole lot of people. You know, he's a man who loves ballet. Mm. Uh, well, he's made to feel like there's something wrong with him. Well, here's a woman who loves cricket, and she's made to feel like there's something wrong with her. Mm. And we immediately say, well, that's crazy. Yes. And yet we can very easily communicate. Yeah. yeah. Robert Claire, thank you so much for your time today. I'm really thankful for your wisdom and the insight that you shared with us, the clarity which you shared. Um, I thank you for your love for Jesus and your love for his church and the way he helped and equipped us at City on a Hill uh, to love Jesus and love one another better. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you.